I wanted to sort of briefly talk about industrial slavery in the South, uh, not because it's new, uh, but because I think it's a really good example of how, not, it's obviously not new, not because it's a new field of study, because it's an, uh, really representative of how there is a new, uh, specifically ideologically focused approach to uh, the literature. Uh, so uh, in the early 21st century, there's this increasing focus on anything non-agricultural or non-plantation slavery uh, in both the North and the South. But again, that's not new. You, you can see this all the way back into the 40s. Uh, there is a focus on the uh, use of slaves in various industries. Um, there's the probably the, the specific landmark study in, from the 50s and 60s is industrial slavery in the Old South. Then, of course, there's uh, Time on the Cross, by Fogel and Engerman, who look at the relationship between, uh, look at the economic uh, impact of slavery. Uh, and what's not, you know, Enger, Fogel and Engerman, I think, get a lot of focus because of the uh, claims about slavery being something compatible with capitalism. Uh, or and I, and I use that word loosely, capitalism, because as I'll talk about, I'm not sure anybody... I'm not sure if any many people in the history field know what they mean when they say that, or use that word. Um, but we'll just use it as a placeholder. Uh, but more importantly, I think, is they specifically say, and it's overlooked when they get talked about, that what they're trying to do is to replace uh, an image of blacks in the Old South, specifically slaves, uh, as uh, people who were incapable, inept, unprepared, with an image of uh, people who were uh, skilled and industrious. Uh, because it's not just about uh, sowing and picking. There's a variety of things, not just on the plantation, but off, that slaves were doing. Uh, so uh, just kind of to give you a ballpark figure, um, Roughly speaking, by 1850s, about 5% of the slave population worked in some industrial capacity. I use that word loosely, too. Uh, there's some distinctions between industry and manufacturing. What, I'm taught, what I mean is something that doesn't involve the planting and harvesting of a crop um, that you sowed. Right. So if you want to count timber as a crop, you can, but I'm talking about tobacco, any of your cereal crops, cotton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so anyway, we've established that in the literature, but what is occurring is that starting maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, what we start to see, because the original literature said, you know, slavery is an agricultural thing. And so the South is economically in, unequipped or whatever, therefore it couldn't succeed. And then we get a turn towards, well, there were these other slaves in significant numbers working in other areas and so on and so forth. And so slavery is more consistent with uh, an American market economy than we first thought. And now uh, we start to see uh, a much more, like I said, ideological driven approach where we've reached the conclusion that uh, slavery uh, could be compatible with industry. It can be com uh, worked into a market economy. What does that tell us then about our current state of affairs? Well, it too must be bad because the original narrative said slavery bad, South bad. We know South is bad because South lost. And so we've applied similar logic to, and by we I mean the scholarly community, has applied similar logic to the same line of thought. Slavery bad, it was compatible with markets, therefore our current economic system is bad. And so I say that because a lot of what is emerging historically is disconnected from history and is more predicated upon some sort of a moral claim, a moral argument, whatever, which is perfectly fine. I mean, we should talk about those things, but uh, rather than being the conclusion, they're actually the starting point, and we, and we backfill history I into those things. And that's why when, I use, when you look at the literature and they talk about capitalism, there's some people that try to clear that up, what they mean, but all they really mean is the system of American economics. Well, how would you describe that? Well, it's capitalism. 
What do you mean by capitalism? Well, it's a system of American economics. And it just kind of goes around and around and around. And nobody can, re at least in the history field, even people that are, you know, even I think Fogel and Ingerman, the cliometricians who are, apply the graphs and the charts and the, the equations and stuff to history, struggle to really define what that is beyond simply a, a platitudinal charge of, well, it's, this is what we do in America. Um, and I think those are some of the things that um, are sort of creating a barrier in the literature uh, today. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times that I have heard lectures, read things by otherwise reputable historians, and of course read papers where, um, you know, like the, the, the statistics that Don cited earlier today about this, the profitability or, excuse me, the prosperity of slavery, um, and they're using those in, in isolation uh, and not able to think beyond what they've already concluded, right? So they, they might cite what Don cited and then they conclude, well, the South lost the war because they couldn't compete. Really? Well, you just said they were really rich. Uh, well, uh, yeah, but, you know, it was all cotton monoculture. Well, you know, there's 80-some years of literature that says otherwise. Oh. And then it kind of ends, it ends there. Or uh, hopefully, you know, they actually look at that and maybe incorporate it into their uh, literature or into their research. Um, but anyway, and the irony, of course, is, as Don also pointed out, people in the Old South didn't deny or try to hide or explain away how they saw their, what they saw as their contributions to American life, right? Um, you know, they never said we're not, and that was the point, right? They were uh, contributing a considerable amount uh, in, in all areas. And so, uh, of course, then the New South narrative comes along, which is, you know, the South lost because of, uh, of slavery inhibits industry. And I think that's where we get confused, is because some Southerners themselves after the war generated that narrative. It was they, they were as much in many ways to blame for ginning that up as many of their northern counterparts. So some of our confusion is, is predicated upon that, um, those narratives, I think, about uh, the New South and their failures and so on and so forth. Um, now, of course, some of it is not confusion at all, right? As I said, um, a lot of it is, a, uh, is an ideological crusade uh, to paint America in general, the South in particular, and market economies in particular in a bad light. And, and this is kind of the history that's susceptible to bad methodology, selective applications of facts, and outcome-based interpretations. And, and it, it actually, that creates confusion. It's not, it's, it really isn't caused by it. Uh, because if you go into something with some sort of deliberate malintent, <laughs> You're, you're not really confused. Um, you're causing confusion instead. Uh, so uh, another thing I think that confuses students, uh, and I use that word loosely too, is the fact that abolitionists and anti-slavery activists start to claim that slavery degrades labor in general. And we get a narrative in the late antebellum period that slavery is incompatible with uh, with free labor, with non-slave labor. And those aren't new claims either. You know, part of what I'm going to talk about is the fact that throughout the colonies, throughout the new states, free laborers in a variety of fields saw slavery as, saw themselves being in competition with slaves for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, we start to get this narrative back at, at the time, which is also echoed from some of the of the other states, uh, for example, Virginia. And, um, you know, I know a lot of states had their upland regions, this one in particular, uh, for example, uh, but in Virginia in particular, there's a pretty good divide between the northwestern, western areas and east. And I'm definitely favorable to them, the, the West Virginia, but if you know that literature and that discussion, there's an extreme bias against the East in how they talk about 
like the constitutional issues of the 1830s, um, because uh, and now they had some grievances like suffrage and taxation, but another grievance was internal improvements, and they argued that internal improvements were being um, uh, repressed or prevented because of this slaveholding elite in the East, and that, that's not true at all. Um, you got all kinds of turnpikes, Stanton, Parkersburg, um, James and Kanawha, Beverly and Fairmont. I mean, there's a huge, huge list of turnpikes. And if you actually drive close to the speed limit uh, in West Virginia, you can, and look closely, you can see the old road signs that say old thus and such turnpike or old thus and such road. Um, and my point there is that, again, that claim of lack of internal improvements is helping to gin up this argument that in upland areas or wherever um, we are seeing slavery as something that is halting development. Um, and, and if I won't, I shouldn't go too far into it, but uh, I'll, I'll actually come back to that next time when I talk on the railroads because there's, there's some, you know, tension between the railroad and the canal and road, um, factions in some of these states. Um, but as I said, this division between, uh, or this dispute about what slavery does to free labor goes back to the colonial era. Um, and so uh, I think it's helpful to look there, and I'll uh, briefly uh, do that um, and hopefully have some time to uh, take some questions. Well, well, we'll make time. But let me uh, again say that my phrases, industrial slavery, non-agricultural slavery, et cetera, are not meant to be necessarily definitive or authoritative or uh, particularly exclusive. Uh, for example, a slave could work on a plantation and have relatively little um, everyday jobs in agriculture. They, they could be um, a blacksmith, for example, or some sort of an artisan, brick maker, uh, carpenter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that you think might be needed in a setting where you are uh, producing something on a scale, uh, they're going to be involved with that. Um, so uh, that's when I talk about the numbers, that includes those slaves, even though it's difficult to fully calculate them because they might not necessarily be classified as one working in one sector or another. They're just on, you know, they're working in so-and-so's plantation or whatever. Um, so um, I'll start briefly uh, in the North because uh, I, I think it helps us understand how um, the understanding of slavery as a fluid institution and a particular form of labor uh, was in some sense common at one point across uh, British North America. Um, and we see that very early on uh, from New York, in New York. Uh, the state had by far the most number of slaves throughout the antebellum period in the North. Uh, New York City um, had uh, about a fifth of its population was enslaved. Um, Forty percent of whites on the island owned slaves at one point. And at, at one point in the mid-18th century, New York, well, Manhattan, um, had the third largest concentration of urban slaves in, in North America, behind Charleston, Charleston and New Orleans. Um, and we can see very early on that um, even in the Dutch period, there was a competition between free and slave uh, laborers, even though... Um, there, uh, initially, the slave laborers in the Dutch, uh, in New Amsterdam, um, did achieve some sort of a semi-free status uh, where they were, um, with the skills they had acquired through various industries and whatnot, able to um, buy, uh, basically buy their freedom, although it was not necessarily something that was hereditary, hereditarily passed down, oftentimes for children were still enslaved. Uh, when the British took over, of course, you know, New York City, this kind of goes back to Don's point, New York City is supposed to be like this hub of the slave trade. I mean, that's really um, the Royal Africa Company, the Duke of York, see this as something that it can be an extremely profitable enterprise to them. And of course, 
you know, that's where the water's muddy economically, right? Because I don't, I don't know a lot about, uh, the, um, you know, the Duke of York. I'm not sure he would have said, I'm a capitalist. Uh, I, you know, he's not thinking in that mindset. Uh, he's thinking about how he can uh, enrich himself, advance the Stuart line, and further the cause of the British Empire. Um, you know, the the market concerns are, you know, something uh, that is doesn't factor into the equation the same way. Um, but a lot of the arguments that are going to be advocated later on are seen in the 17th century. A lot of tradesmen believe they're impoverished because of slavery. And it's because the slaves are picking up these various skills. Um, a lot of the tradesmen, of course, it's an apprentice system. I think I met somebody in here that's in an apprentice. Where, where, where? Oh, yeah, there you are. You know, so there, there's this apprentice system. Even the apprentice system was adapted um, uh, and to, to fit uh, slavery in some ways because a lot of the, the masters would buy slaves and they would apprentice them. So, that in, so instead of cycling through various free men, uh, they, would, they would train these slaves, which, of course, um, a lot of people believed was going to depress um, uh, laborers, uh, other free white uh, laborers who are trying to do the same thing. So we see a variety of divisions um, uh, in, uh, in New York society. Um, generally speaking, though, the wages are going to stay uh, the same. Um, about a, a dollar a day, uh, non-farm laborers, white and black. Um, and that's, gonna rem that's a pretty common thing, is that we don't r see a lot of that wage depression, at least not like we think we should or would. Um, and again, I'm not an economist, so I won't comment on the, the uh, features or structures of a particular place that caused that to happen, except to say that it was the reality. Um, and so, uh, you know, take it as you will. We see a similar thing in Baltimore, um, which is going to have the highest free black population by the war. Uh, one of the concerns in Baltimore uh, is not so much that slaves are being used or even that free blacks are being used. It's that, like, especially after the Panic of 37 and other economic downturns, that they're being used instead of free whites. So the real issue is not so much with slavery per se, it's with this idea that I'm not being employed um, and, and thus you know, I'm being impoverished because of this particular uh, system. Um, so, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the trades in particular uh, that, that blacks are in. Um, again, it, it, Baltimore is about the same as New York City, a dollar a day uh, for industrial wages in the city. And, you know, we kind of got to, you know, we got to keep that in mind too. Um, you know, the, the current debate about the minimum wage and whatnot kind of obscures the fact that, you know, there are reasons that certain positions in certain areas get paid more or less than corresponding positions in other areas. Um, so, like, the McDonald's in, I don't know if there really is a McDonald's in Times Square, um, but uh, if there is a McDonald's in Times Square, I would assume that they might get paid more than the, the McDonald's in Elkins, because there's, like, more people in one apartment building there than there is in Elkins. So, it's just, and, and that's just one example. Um, it, it could be, it, it could be anything. Um, so, uh, the point is, though, is that uh, the city itself, and we'll see this kind of throughout the South, the city has its particular wage standards that aren't necessarily, apl necessarily applied elsewhere. So, for example, um, the CNO, laborers on the CNO Canal, which eventually actually the, the company Im Im uh, imports 500 English indentured servants to work on the canal, um, they, are, they are not making a dollar a day. Rural laborers are not making a dollar a day, and Western coal miners, Western Maryland coal miners, would not make a dollar a day until after the war. And, and of course, that's an average, right? Because um, especially in, play, in things like coal mining, uh, you know, you're not necessarily guaranteed to work 
every day or even consistently over a period of weeks or even months, depending on uh, the situation. The B&O just didn't, we'll talk more about this later, but the B&O did not use um, slave labor to any extensive amount um, after its, its first year in operation. Um, we see the same thing in ironworks. Now, ironworks um, are heavily vertically, in, vertically integrated in the colonial area, era. They own the mine. They own uh, furnaces. They own forests to fuel them. And they have at least made an effort to construct some sort of means of transportation from between those various sites and then from the production to whatever market they're in. Um, so uh, they're, in other words, they're something a little bit more sophisticated than, you know, a brick making or, or an artisan trade being a cobbler or a hat maker or a haberdasher or whatever in the city itself. They're going to be out farther. Um, uh, we find a lot of company-owned slaves in the iron industry um, because it is easy to um, train them to ensure that they're going to be skilled workers. And as we're going to see, a lot, of, uh, a lot of plantations hire out their slaves. A lot of them are reluctant to do so in an industry where there might be hazards. Um, we'll talk about more of this when we come to mining, but um, uh, slaves uh, that tended to be higher, more skilled, tended to be company-owned because there's a greater risk involved if you're hiring your, your slave out. Um, and actually, in the ironworks, uh, slaves tended to be most of the skilled labor because they worked there longer. Uh, and that's another thing we kind of have to, and, and I don't, by we, I mean our 21st century society in general, most free white people were not thinking, I'm going to grow up, get a job, earn a wage. Uh, their mindset is, I'm going to you know, become a, a master craftsman. I'm going to own my own farm. I'm going to be uh, towards the top of the, the economic food chain rather than at the bottom. And if I'm at the bottom at all, it's a temporary situation. right? I work for a week, a month, whatever. I get whatever cash I can, and I'm gone. Uh, it's the off-season and whatever I'm working in on the farm, work a little bit, gone. Um, slaves, on the other hand, had the ability to accumulate considerable skill um, in these areas. Uh, and the Maryland Chemical Works is a good example of this. They employed 15 slaves year-round, um, as well as a uh, varying number of uh, free white workers. And they found the white workers actually being, they said, entitled and prone to other things civic commitments, social groups, clubs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, uh, slaves are going to be limited in those sorts of areas, their ability to, you know, engage in civic groups and social clubs and so on and so forth. Um, I think that this gives us a little bit of insight into how we should approach these things. A lot of, especially from Fogelman and Engel Angerman, uh, a lot of these approaches are based on the efficiency of slavery. And that's fine. And it's nice to do all those calculations, which I don't understand. Uh, anything, anything above a plus or a minus is beyond me. Um, but we also need to look at the labor history from the other side. Not a lot of labor groups have complained about the fact that their industries have put them in a position to be less efficient uh, you know, and if you look at the history of labor, a lot of it is battling against new technologies that the owners think will improve efficiency uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and I, I don't want to wade into those weeds. I'm simply saying that if you look at it from the perspective of people at the time, efficiency is not necessarily their primary goal to produce the last bit of whatever, the last shoe, the last brick, the last yard of track. The last chunk of coal is not necessarily, you know, the end-all, be-all of their existence. Uh, so I think we should kind of keep that in mind uh, as we approach these things, because when we look at things like efficiency, we might get a certain result 
run the numbers and you reach a conclusion, but we're not necessarily seeing the situation as they would have seen it. And by they, I mean the, whether it be North or the South, people in general. Obviously, you know, an owner, a master, uh, whatever, is going to want to maximize that as much as possible within reason, right? And that's why, you know, a lot of them, as we'll see, are reluctant to hire out their slaves in some areas uh, because they don't want them to get hurt or they see them, uh, they see them uh, particularly ill-treated, uh, for example. Um, and w we can see this wage comparison and this skill comparison across the country, I think. So in the Midwest or the West or whatever it's called, Illinois, Indiana, I don't, I don't know how they identify themselves. I'm not sure the government's classifications are worth much, but anyway. Uh, so out there uh, in the Jacksonian area, the, the 20s to the 40s, the Illinois led the way with about $12 a day, um, plus board, um, some sort of a room, clothing, food. And that's important uh, because when we look at other industries, if you read the 1832 McLean report, which you can find for free online, even though it's not well scanned in, uh, of, of all the industries in the country, um, you'll see that a lot of the smaller mills, Delaware, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, whether it be iron or textiles or whatever, they're not, they're not giving board. Right? You're on your own. Uh, you might get $2 a day. A dollar is about, I, I, I did a ballpark average and like $1.25 was about the average uh, that you're making. But you might not be working year round. Right? A lot of them were very clear. We only run for nine months, 10 months. Others ran all the time. A couple of them said every day except for 4th of July and Christmas, um, which is ironic because those are probably the two days that you know, our society cares least about now, and at least in terms of not working. Um, uh, but uh, so uh, you know, we see a pretty big disparity um, in terms of uh, the, uh, we see a pretty big disparity in terms of what some of the um, companies that are hiring free laborers are providing and what some of the companies that are hiring uh, slaves um, are providing. So, uh, you know, we see a comparable wage uh, from farms across uh, the states and that's comparable also to that in the South. Um, some had higher wages in the North and vice versa, but there, there's really no consistent division between the wages, um, free or slave, white or black, in the regions. Now, there might be a difference in an industry east and west within a state, urban or rural, coastal or interior, but there's no clear north and south divide. So uh, we don't necessarily see that clear depression of, of wages that uh, people uh, believed uh, was happening uh, at the time. Um, and, and I shouldn't do this, but you know, the way the work stoppage thing, we're, we're kind of used to, you know, we go to Walmart at, you know, 2.37 you know, on Thanksgiving Day as we're stuffing a turkey leg in our mouth uh, and wiping gravy off of our shirt. And we sort of assume that every place is open all the time. You know, I drove the ice cream truck. I was not driving the ice cream truck on Thanksgiving Day or the day before or after. Most people aren't in the market for door-to-door -door ice cream services in, in it, well, let me rephrase that. Most people in West Virginia and Southwestern Pennsylvania, I can't speak to the door-to-door -door ice cream market in South Carolina, at least the coastal regions. Um, likewise, when I worked at the sawmill, uh, you know, sort of like a classic industrial job, right? We weren't working every day. It was, if it's a particularly rainy summer, sometimes they can't cut. Regulations prevent them from clearing land if it's too wet because of the, it, of the imprint that it leaves on the ground. So they had a stack of boards. Well, you can only move lumber from one pile to the next so many times before it becomes clear that there's no longer any purpose for moving it from one to the next. So they sent us home, right? We'll call you, right? It was like a week or two before they said, hey, you can come back because we got something to, for you to stack. So we got something for you, new for you to stack. You don't have to keep stacking old things. So, again, that's a, a thing that is still very much present in some ways, although I'll be clear, I don't 
know a lot about the full-time ice cream truck driver industry. Um, so I won't say much more on that, but the point is those sorts of things are still around, and I think that we ignore them at our peril. Um, Old Virginia, as I've hinted at, provides a, a lot of examples of industrial slavery, um, and also slavery owned or uh, slaves owned by companies. Alexander Spotswood had an ironworks near Fredericksburg, um, where most of his sla uh, in labor force was enslaved. Um, and we see, again, a similar pattern repeating itself as we do in the coal mines. A uh, great example was Harry uh, Heath's mines, the Black Heath Pits. That was General Harry Heath's grandfather, whose name was also Harry Heath, around Richmond. He employs a considerable number of slaves. Um, and um, what we actually see... Um, and I wasn't able to find specific numbers on this, but you know, after in the 1830s, there was a manumission boom in Virginia. And in, because of the things that you were talking about earlier, Don, there was a boost in manumission for about a decade or so. And a, after Heath sells his company to the English, they actually start using free blacks. Um, there were many blacks who had acquired their freedom in various ways and had these skilled positions um, that uh, the company desi the English company desired. Um, and again, I don't, uh, I haven't been able to find a lot of records on that, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, we see this throughout uh, the the Midlothian Company. Tredegar Ironworks bought them out um, again to to vertically um, integrate uh, a little bit more. Tredegar owned slaves and used slaves. Uh, and afterwards, after the war. They continue to hire free blacks into the 1870s, again, because of the, um, that, those skilled uh, positions. And this actually tracks with, other, with larger conclusions at, uh, after the war. Um, the wage gap, for example, between whites and blacks explodes in the 1890s. Um, it's not actually right after the war that you get that problem. Um, and several states can show us that there's a substantial class of free blacks um, prior to the war um, that are finding employment in these areas and then afterwards um, parlaying that into, um, into employment after the war with, with or where and with whoever was left. Um, similar, though, we do see white uh, wages, white unskilled labor uh, suffers considerably after the war. Um, and there we, that's when we start to see their wages go down. Um, I might save mining for tomorrow, uh, at least coal mining, or at least uh, the, for what I was going to say more about the coal mining, uh, but salt mines are another great example of this. Um, if, uh, the Charleston area in Kanawha County, what's now West Virginia, he, uh, heavy salt producer. Most of the slaves in Kanawha County before the war were owned by the salt mines because – um, well, first of all, there weren't that many to begin with. Uh, secondly, um, actually, Harry Heath tried this. He tried to move slaves over the mountains to work in the salt mines he owned in Kanawha County. It did not end well. Um, they spent really more, the, the, some of them escaped, and, and it, it was a mess. So it was just easier for them to own the slaves outright rather than trying to rely on plantation owners um, from various uh, other places, or even in the East, to um, supply uh, labor to them. Um, and another reason is that, uh, as I said before, the mines could be particularly dangerous. Explosions, uh, various equipment, uh, those sorts of things um, is, are not something that is uh, for the faint of heart. So a lot of owners did not want to put their slaves at risk in that way. Um, and now I'll talk, so I'll say a little bit more about the railroads and coal mining uh, in the next one, because uh, I want to um, say a few words about the Deep South, um, because I think that, uh, in, at least as, as I look to literature, that's the region that's most susceptible to this myth about uh, Southern industrial slavery uh, because of its association uh, with cotton. And you mentioned Olmsted. He went through the Deep South. I think he went through like 50 uh, uh, Mississippi Delta counties. 
uh, in, in the greater Mississippi Delta region, Louisiana, a few in Mississippi and, and some in uh, East Texas. And he, that was his conclusion, right? Slavery's holding the region back. Again, he only sees a few counties. He does the same. That's like everywhere he goes, right? He looks at a few things. He, he was in southwestern Virginia, saw a few uh, you know, uh, mountain valley plantations and, and draws these uh, sort of conclusions uh, about it. Uh, but um, we do see, though, uh, serious industrial output uh, in the deep south states. Uh, now, it obviously took a little bit longer, uh, but you have coal fields in North Alabama um, that are going to be opening up uh, in the 1840s and 50s. Um, then they're operating in many, much the same way for much the same reasons. A lot of white laborers in the area are not reliable, and they're not looking for steady wage work. They're not necessarily people that are in it for the long haul. Now, Alabama companies, though, were not sufficiently capitalized to buy their own slaves. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more about in my next talk. Um, and this is a really a case where there is a labor shortage because Alabama plantation owners are reluctant to hire out their slaves um, because of the dangerous work uh, involved. Uh, one <laughs> particular uh, mine owner struggled with labor shortages for 30 years, and that basically bankrupted him. He sold his property, leased it back during, uh, leased it back after the war, and got a bunch of free blacks from the Freedman's Bureau, um, uh, which is kind of ironic, I think, if you think about it. Um, <clears throat> and I think, so this, I think, shows a few things. Um, one, uh, even those who do talk about industrial capacity in the South claim it was consistently behind the North in terms of innovation. That's not true. Um, the, the South was not using antiquated methods. Uh, for, like, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the mines in Alabama were using the best mining techniques in the world. They were, get, they were bringing in engineers and, and coal mining experts from the North and Great Britain. Um, the, I think there were one, there was like, I read about one or two that were um, weren't drifting. They were basically taking it off. This basically primitive surface mining. Um, uh, but uh, there, this is not the case that they're using um, uh, primitive techniques because that's part of the New South uh, narrative too. Is that well, the industry that was there was primitive, or or um, antiquated, I should say. And so even slaves that were involved had all of this knowledge that was like 30 years behind everybody. And so when they went to try to get jobs after the war with various northern capitalists opening up companies, they, they really weren't skilled, uh, which is not the case. They were um, keeping up with these innovations as, as much as anybody, anybody else, because that's what you do uh, to the best of your ability when you're in business. Um, and I shouldn't camp on this, but um, I think, and, and so I'm from West Virginia. I went to WVU for my PhD, and so I'm really a product, I guess, in some ways of their school of thought. But, and I, don't, I, won't, I won't mention any names, but if you look at the literature that's produced by a lot of Appalachian scholars, they're trying to deal um, with, this, with these facts. And um, so, for example, um, uh, some of them struggle to deal with the fact that um, uh, slaves are employed in non-agricultural pursuits on a large scale. And their struggle is not ba with that fact. It's not based on the facts. It's based on the fact, it's based on their belief that they've already concluded and made some sort of moral judgment about the institution and somehow how that moral judgment affected the efficiency or effectiveness or the production of the plant or the company itself. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude. I know we're running out of time. I've got a lot um, more here I could say about all different kinds of things. But I'll scroll down quickly to say a little bit about Charleston. Um, uh, Charleston was very similar to New York in colonial New York in terms of its 
uh, into the relationship between slaves and industry and also between free workers and those slaves. Um, uh, slave labor was, uh, was set at a dollar a day. Uh, Charleston, Savannah, Mobile, Norfolk, uh, and a few other cities actually had a minimum, sl minimum wage law um, to keep uh, white wages at a certain level so you couldn't undercut them by hiring slaves. Um, but we start to see very early on, not to the, ex or actually to a greater extent, I think, in New York, labor trying to, or white labor trying to organize itself against um, various groups, employees, et cetera, that are trying to hire uh, slave labor and, and undercut them. Uh, and again, there's a lot, I actually have a lot more data here, but I just kind of wanted to lay that out and say that none of this is particularly new. Uh, you know, oh, these people that are getting this information are, the 1860 census is not new um, by any, by, by most stretch of the imagination. It's information that was already out there. Uh, there are some problems with it, especially in the, uh, a lot of the literature suggests that the Gulf states are, uh, industry is very underrepresented in that census, and there was a lot more going on there, which helps fuel this notion that they, there was a significant lag uh, between them. But I think we should s start to think about how we can wipe the slate clean in terms of what we're trying to say, uh, because the information has been out there for a while. It's been uh, bandied about. And rather than produce any sort of new conclusions, all we really have go uh, got to is a calcified, petrified, and decrepit um, uh, ideology which is methodologically flawed um, and doesn't really seek to understand history. It rather simply seeks to advance whatever modern agenda happens to be wielding it. And so... Uh, in terms of, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if anybody said it out right, but it's sort of like where we go from here and things like that is, uh, at least in, in those sorts of terms, we start from the beginning and really think about what we want to try to conclude. Uh, or let me rephrase that. Rather than think about what we want to conclude, uh, we should first look at what the actual facts are. Because when we start thinking about what we want to conclude, and I see this all the time with students, they say, I want, to, I want to show this. I want to show that. Well, their paper usually ends up showing this or that, but in a very convenient way. And those sorts of um, arguments are, that sort of methodology is becoming increasingly widespread. There's a lot more I can say about that.